Thank you everyone for joining us for this online talk with photographer and author Ginger Chi. And thank you, Ginger, for being with us today and sharing your work and your story with us. Thank you um, for inviting me. Yeah, thank, thank you for <laughs> <laughs> it's all gonna be amazing. Um, before we begin, if I could ask everyone to please mute your audio if you're not muted for better sound quality, that would be great. And also if you could please hold your questions until the end, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, today, Ginger will present her uh, pre will present her book, The Dalai Lama: Leadership and the Power of Compassion, and craft an intricate tapestry of the Tibetan diaspora, finely woven through accounts from the Dalai Lama's life, the everyday lives of the Tibetan people, and the insights of a leadership coach. Uh, Ginger Chi has been documenting her worldwide life and travels for over four decades. She was born in Beijing, China, to a Chinese father and a mother who is half Japanese and half indigenous Chinese. At the age of three, her family fled China, settling in Japan, then in the United States, and later the United Kingdom. Ginger started her photography career in New York City with a focus on multiculturalism. She collaborated on a book, A Place Called Chinese America, that tells the story of Chinese immigration history. In her professional life, Ginger worked as a management consultant and executive coach in the USA, Asia, and Europe from 1988. She holds an MBA from New York University and a PhD from Cambridge, Cambridge University. As an executive coach, she found, the integrating, she found that integrating the teachings of the Dalai Lama resulted in more harmonious workplace relationships and deeper understanding of cultural differences. As a student of Tibetan Buddhist teachings and its meditative practices, she applied her skills as a photographer to document the Tibetan diaspora and its preservation of cultural and national identity in exile. Over the past 10 years, Ginger has photographed her numerous visits to over two dozen Tibetan refugee communities in India and Nepal. Ginger has taken photographs of various aspects of the Tibetan community showing day-to-day -day life with residents in educational, religious, and cultural activities she has an ability to draw out people's stories, which she has incorporated into her narrative. This is her gift to the Tibetan community and her way to express appreciation by preserving and sharing its culture. The Dalai Lama has taken a special interest in this project and granted access to his archival photos and private living areas. Those who read her book and see her photographs will have a firsthand experience of the sights and sounds of Tibetan culture in exile. Without further ado, please welcome Ginger Chi. Thank you, Anne, and thank you very much for joining. I see uh, 31 people have joined. Although I'm saying this is my journey, it's also the journey of the Dalai Lama and his people, the D Tibetan diaspora. Um, so let me begin with a brief overview. Unique to Tibet is the Dalai Lama. Here he is at the age of four who is a reincarnation of the previous Dalai Lamas. This one is number 14, which means he's been reincarnated 14 times. And um, very um, special to the Tibetans, the reincarnation has a specific sequence. So what happens is when the Dalai Lama dies, there's a regent until they find a new Dalai Lama. And the region would dream or he would see uh, signs, divination, uh, divination, all kinds of things. And then he would start getting messages. So in this case, he saw in his vision a roof of a house that was very unique and some letters. And so they went to um, East Tibet and they found the roof and they found this little two-year-old who then started saying, mine, mine. He was, uh, uh, you know, point to, pointing to all these uh, things that belonged to him as the 13th Dalai Lama. And word got out that they had found the Dalai Lama. So he, this little boy at two was sent to a monastery. And until the Tibetans could pay some ransom money, he was kept there by the warlord. And finally, in 1940, when he was four, so this is still in his outfit before he's the Dalai Lama, um, he was taken with his family to, um, to Lhasa. Oops, sorry. And um, 
I wanted to also give you a little bit of political um, overview. In 1950, 80,000 soldiers from the People's Liberation Army crossed the river into Tibet. And at that time, the Dalai Lama was given full temporal authority. He was only 15 years old. And around that time, his older brother, who um, is a monk at Omdo, where, where the family lives, uh, came running. And essentially, he said he's been a prisoner in his monastery. And he was asked by the Chinese um, um, army to see if he can persuade the Dalai Lama to, um, to participate. And if he said no, then he, his brother was to kill him. So essentially, um, they realized the situation was really, really bad. And so at this point, he's 15 years old and um, the leader of 6 million Tibetans and they um, faced the threat of full-scale war. Dalai Lama then sent delegates to US, UK, Nepal to ask for help, but no help came. And then he tried to uh, convince the, um, uh, the Chinese and he actually even spent about a year uh, with, with Mao Zedong. Um, trying to persuade persuade him to uh, leave Tibet alone. And essentially, over the next nine years, um, the Chinese kept coming closer and cl closer and into Tibet. So then we're in 1959. He just passed his monastic examination, which is equal to a doctorate. And something weird happened. So the Chinese general who was in charge of Tibet invited him for a show saying, let's celebrate your graduation. And then he said, by the way, do not bring your bodyguards with you. Well, the Tibetans heard about it. And so um, they, just, they just surrounded the palace and the Dalai Lama couldn't leave. Um, and I'm introducing you the oracles here, but I will explain a little bit more. So Dalai Lama consulted with the oracle and he was instructed to leave the country that night. And he was disguised as a soldier and he slipped past his people. Uh, three weeks later, he reached India and he has been living in India in asylum ever since. He's today 87 years old. Now I will start my story. My journey began in Zurich in 2005, where I first attended the Dalai Lama's public talk. So this is in Switzerland. And um, I was way, way up in, in the sky. And when he entered, you can hardly see him. Um, when he entered, the um, stadium was filled with positive energy and excitement. We were all captivated by his charismatic presence and message of compassion. He spoke to the critical issues of the world, injustice, suffering, poverty, and materialism. He was passionate about how humans abuse our only home, the planet Earth. And then he said, uh, we could each make a difference by taking small steps. I believed him and I started to study Tibetan Buddhism and I started traveling to attend the Dalai Lama's teachings. Uh, Anne mentioned that I was running a um, leadership program in Europe. And what I did was I took his teaching and took um, Buddhist philosophy of kindness, compassion, and respect into <laughs> the leadership program because they were trying to build um, cross-cultural teams and you absolutely need all this for teamwork. And it was very successful. And I felt that it was time for me to give something back. And when I heard the Tibet Fund, uh, which is the primary funding organization dedicating to supporting the Tibetan communities in exile and in Tibet, uh, wanted to document um, the diaspora, I volunteered. And um, the then uh, director created the itinerary made introductions and also um, got 
permission from the Indian government for me to go and visit these settlements and actually stay there. Otherwise, people cannot, um, cannot stay there. And so at that point, I started my parallel life, um, traveling, photographing the Tibetan diaspora, mostly Nepal and India, and then continuing uh, my work as an executive coach. Um, my book was published November 2022, so you can see how long this project took. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about publishing my book, so if you're interested, uh, ask me during the question and answer period. All right. So this is a map of the Tibetan settlements in India and Nepal. You can see there are quite a few of them. The ones on the bottom, the south part of India, I went to all of them. Those are the large settlements. And then um, to the east of India, um, those are quite small. And um, I didn't go, but north of India, Darjeeling, Kalimpo, all of that area, I've been, um, all of the settlement in Nepal. So it's a lot of settlement I went to and documented. You'll see some of the photographs from these settlements. Now, this is a photograph of Dharamsala, and it was taken from the courtyard where the Dalai Lama's compound is. Um, when I traveled to the settlements, everywhere I went, people would show me around, and then they would say, because of the Dalai Lama, we were able to, you know, uh, all kinds of things, like um, start cooperative, uh, do organic farming. And I really felt that I needed to meet the Dalai Lama to complete my narrative. In 2018, um, I was there doing Tibetan New Year, which is called Lhasa. Now, most mornings when he is in Dharamsala, he receives a few hundred visitors in the courtyard. So you see these nuns lining up. So you start by lining up and there, there could be like 200, 300 people lining up. Then what he does is people kind of goes in clusters. So it could be family clusters or school clusters. And so he, he would meet them. And what I saw was greeting people. He would speak to them and shake their hands, listening, uh, blessing. And um, one day he had about 400 people. And you could tell he was really, really tired, but he was greeting every single one of them. Then this one is after he greets everybody, then people sit around him and then he has a monk who photographs and then he, people can get these photographs. So um, one morning, he, he always looks at the monk and then he saw me standing right next to the monk and said, who are you? And then somebody pushed me. So I was three feet from the Dalai Lama. And I told him, oh, I was born in China. My family escaped um, a communist China eight years before he did. And I grew up in Japan. And I told him that I had gone to the settlements. And I was documenting how his people preserved Tibetan culture. So then he smiled and said, I want to meet you privately. And that's how I spent five Five, actually five weeks with the Dalai Lama. Now, when I first, before I even met him, I was invited to this. So you remember I was saying that um, the Oracle um, told the Dalai Lama to escape. So this is uniquely Tibetan. And the Oracle is not like the Greek Oracle. This person is the reincarnation of the main protector Oracle of the Dalai Lama. And in fact, not only is he the protector um, oracle, but they also do uh, divination, prediction. Um, they, um, the, the government in exile consults with the oracle uh, at the beginning of the year. And this is where um, I photographed. The oracle has saved this particular Dalai Lama quite a few times and previous Dalai Lama quite a few times as well. And a few days after da Dalai Lama escaped, the Chinese actually bombed 
his living quarters, he would have been dead. Now, he is a monk, and he goes into a trance. And once he goes into a trance, the spirit of Neijun goes into his body. And so um, the sp it's the spirit is the oracle, and he's the medium. So here you see the, the uh, oracle with this really heavy hat. If he wasn't in a trance, uh, it could be 35, 40 pounds. He wouldn't have been able to, to wear this. So he's paying respect to the Dalai Lama. This is Dalai Lama in his private temple. And then it, it was a very elaborate and long um, ceremony. The, um, the Tibetan government officials were there. And then I was the only um, non-Tibetan uh, photographing. And it was just amazing, uh, loud with music, elaborate. And then when the oracle finishes um, and gets out of the trance, he actually collapses and they're stiff as a board and they get taken into another room where the attendants must massage them because you know they're really stiff as a board. And then they come in and have tea. Now, when this finished, they quickly took me down the hill to the reception room. And here is His Holiness. You can see my little iPad. Um, and they had told me, even if I was studying uh, Tibetan Buddhism, not to treat him as a monk, but just to enter and sit there because he really wanted to find out my impressions of um, the settlements. And he said, this is very casual. I'm meeting him as a human being. So just treat him like this. So you can see how casually I'm sitting here. And he gives me this white scarf to, to welcome me. And then he, um, he's asking questions. And I brought a whole lot of photographs. And he's looking at the photographs. I was told I had 30 minutes. He's looking at the photographs, asking lots of questions. And I have five minutes left. And he said, oh, do you have a question? Well, at that point, I had five minutes. And so I just said, you know, what I'm doing, um, please share with me whatever story you want to. I was very, very lucky. He gave me a two and a half hour taped interview. So this is the story that he started telling me. He said, the story of preserving Tibetans begins with my escape. And then he told me, uh, he is the, the second on horse. He told me, how he put on a soldier's uniform, took off his glasses, because I think hardly anybody wore glasses. And then he said he could vaguely see the Chinese soldiers across the river and was really frightened um, because um, the horse's hoofs were making so much noise. And he was hoping to negotiate uh, for peace with the Chinese, but he found out the uh, Tibetan government had dissolved the Tibetan government. Sorry, the Chinese uh, had dissolved the Tibetan government, so he had no choice. And in March 1959, he asked for asylum in India. He was 23 years old. What happened was when he arrived in India, he did not expect 85,000 people to follow him. He had to put aside his plan to win independence and solve the enormous challenge of taking care of the health and safety of the refugees. The refugees were given work to build roads in the mountains. Most of them were nomads and farmers and were not accustomed to road building. Many of the Tibetans died from heat exhaustion and rocks from falling. The Dalai Lama had always disliked protocol and in exile, he walked around among his people um, he saw the children suffer the most. Most of them were sick, and so many of them were orphans. So he asked his elder sister to start a school for the orphans. So this is the school, which is really not a school. Um, their, main, um, their main thing was to uh, provide shelter, food, and clothing. And so it provided a sense of place and belonging. Education came much later. 
Now, before the Dalai Lama even built the settlements, he took care of the children because education is actually providing the future of uh, Tibet. And both the Dalai Lama and the Indian Prime Minister Nehru felt that if the children were absorbed into the Indian schools, they would soon be assimilated and the Tibetan culture will be lost. So um, this was an Indian school created for the Tibetans. And um, then the Tibetans created their own school, which is called the Tibetan Children's Village. And there, um, the children lived not in dormitories, but in homes. So this is a mother. She has her own family, but she is the mother of the maybe 30 children who live in this uh, home. Children are taught to be self-sufficient, and so they do the cooking. Little children are um, little children are um, maybe counting spoons, and then as they get older, they're actually uh, frying the food. This is an example of what it looks like inside. There's not much room. Now, um, although some of the children are orphans, some of the children were brought out of Tibet by family members while the parents stayed in Tibet. And this is because the Tibetans wanted um, their own children to grow up in, uh, in freedom. And um, when I gave uh, a talk in, in, uh, in New York, a number of them came and said, uh, they actually uh, were um, sent to India and they never saw their family again. But what happens is so many of our children are in the same situation that, you know, they think it's sort of normal. I saw so many kids um, just interact. Oh, they're, they're just so, um, they're just so warm towards each other. There's always singing and wherever I went, uh, if they were singing, they would sing in Chinese because the teacher said I was Chinese. And then she said, but she lives in uh, America. Then they would sing in, uh, in English. So they already learn Hindi, Tibetan, English, and Chinese, so four languages. And here is an English class. The schools also taught uh, music, art, dancing, philosophy. And the Dalai Lama had actually said, no matter where the, the diaspora live, as long as they preserve the language and culture, Tibet will live on. The children are educated, so they have the knowledge and the skills to live in the modern world. The Dalai Lama often visits the schools and give teachings on Buddhist ethics. In one of the visits, this is a, a children's um, village in Dharamsala near him, he told the students that they're there out of the kindness of others. Others before self then became the motto for TCB. In Tibetan schools in India and Nepal, children begin the school day praying for peace, love, and compassion. Education is a huge success story. In Tibet, literacy was low among the people. In one generation of exile, 99% of the youth are literate. After taking care of the children, he started building communities. Here's a young Dalai Lama walking among the settlers. And you see him here. The Tibetans were offered jungle land in South India. They had to clear, dig wells, build houses, cultivate land. Um, and, you know, their, Tibet is up in the high altitude. And what they do is they use melting snow to irrigate the, the fields. But in India, um, they had to learn how to cultivate their field using the monsoon season. And for them, um, I mean, so many of them were sick because they're not used to this climate. And the Dalai Lama himself wasn't sure if they were gonna be successful, but he felt that if um, he collapsed, then everything would be, um, everything would not, it would fail. So he said, you know, I'm sure you can do it. If you need anything, just let me know. And he basically gave them a vision 
And then he said, I can give you support, but try and do this. And he thought that if they had some successes, they would develop confidence. And then in time, they would have a lot of confidence. So already at that age, this leadership style um, was very apparent and um, he never micromanaged. And what, what I saw was um, that the people were really uh, implementing, organizing and running uh, settlements. Okay. Starting from here are some of the photographs I took. This is a typical scene. Um, this is an older person, a uh, Tibetan woman with a prayer uh, wheel. And um, they're spinning and spinning. And the instrument on the left is um, they make butter tea. So I think they're making cheese and butter, butter milk. Okay. So what you see is the Tibetan way of life is um, the way they live in the settlements because they build houses, filled it with um, what they're used to. They speak Tibetan. Some of the largest settlements have schools. So they live in isolation of, of India and really um, as opposed to America where you know, pe people try to assimilate. This is a non-assimilate model. This is a typical settlement of office and the, the people who work for the government wear their traditional outfit. Okay. So central to Tibet Buddhism is training the mind to turn adversary to advantage and transform problems into opportunities. And so what they do is um, meditation, prayer, the way of living is so connected to Tibetan Buddhism. But this process enables them to maintain their dignity and spirit in the face of difficulties. Um, the community has risen to the challenge really transforming adverse, adverse circumstances with great determination and enthusiasm. The ordinary family has continued in the wake of culture disasters. Uh, this woman in India, North, in, North India Ladakh lives in one room and it, it's really quite amazing. So at night, this, she sleeps here and because I was visiting, um, she invited me to have tea. And I actually was quite surprised at how friendly the Tibetans are towards me in spite of my being part Chinese. And one of the Tibetans said, oh, had I come earlier, uh, people would have felt hostile, but the Dalai Lama had told people not to hate the Chinese people, it's the government. and." Uh, people must distinguish between government and the people. This is another um, typical scene. Um, this is a group of um, children. Actually, they're not settlement. There are a few um, communities, very, very poor. And, um, you know, they're calm, they're peaceful. They, they're together, but they seem to be, you know, deep in their own thought. They don't really have much, they're playing with pebbles, but they look quite content and happy. This, um, I went to quite high in the Himalayas to look for nomads. So this is a nomad, you see the tent here. I stayed with them. Um, this is a family and uh, these are pashmina goats. Inside the tent, so again, you see the on the side, those are the rolled up carpets. And she cooked this amazing meal on this little stove using um, yak, yak dung for fuel. Okay. So a few hundred nomads still live year round in tents. They follow their yak up into the Himalayas in the summer and then further down the mountains in the winter. And as the kids get older, they would be sent to one of the schools so that they would learn to read and write and, and um, be educated. In the, in the settlements, um, there are people who are weaving, um, there are people who are embroidering. This is a, a ceremonial rope for monks. And 
artists also live in the uh, settlements. Uh, he's painting at Tanka. But as you can see, it's very, very poor. And um, I saw mostly women and older men and women with little children. But the uh, younger people, there's, there's very, very little um, way to make a living there. And so the majority of the Tibetans actually sell sweater in stalls along major bus and train stations in India. So this is one of the sweater sellers. So they'll be away from the family for months and months. And typically they will go back during New Year's. Elders, um, there are some senior homes, but it's for people who don't have families. So most of the Tibetans, elders live with their children. And as you can see, the, the gentleman on the side, he's prayer with the mala bees. Communities gather for important functions, such as the Dalai Lama's birthday. And this is, they're throwing barley for blessing and for good luck. The Tibetans taught, uh, sorry, the Dalai Lama taught the Tibetans, home is where you live in your community um, and the people who care and host you. And this was very apparent when I was in, um, this is the cell settlement in 2018 during Tibetan New Year celebration. And the whole community is engaged in um, participating. And at a certain day, people started uh, going to Dharamsala to uh, give blessings to the Dalai Lama and also to participate in his teaching. And I went there as well. This is a young family living in the Bay Area. And they're standing right outside of the gate of the Dalai Lama's compound. Um, I wanted to show you this because um, when the Tibetans uh, first escaped. Switzerland was the first Western country. They uh, invited a thousand orphans. America, on the other hand, um, didn't really want to get involved. And it wasn't until the 1990 Immigration Act that a thousand Tibetans were invited to um, live in America. And they did not want to use the word refugee, so they called them displaced people because they did not want to provoke the Chinese government. Here is Dalai Lama um, sitting outside of the, the main temple um, to give a talk. He doesn't really like to wear these hats, but on certain occasions, he wears hats and puts on um, special clothing as required. And this is um, the courtyard. It's people were, I just could photograph a bit, but I don't know, thousands of people were there. And um, yeah, he knows he's the focus of the Tibetan people's hope and trust. And um, because of his stature among the Tibetans, he actually has um, started to um, bring modern elements. And even if you see these monks dressed to, um, in the typical robe, he's made quite a lot of changes, which I'm gonna talk about. So one of the things that he's done is he had said that, um, He's, one of his job is to preserve Tibetan Buddhist culture. This is his private temple. And to the left of him is, um, sorry, on the left side of the photograph is the statue of Guru Rinpoche who brought Buddhism to Tibet in the eighth century. And what the Dalai Lama noticed is people just praying and praying, constantly praying. And he just started saying, what is the point of praying if you don't know what you're praying about? And so he, he, when he teaches, he said, don't just listen to me and believe, 
you have to actually think about what I said. If you don't believe in it, question, don't just believe it because I said it to you. And so he's getting people to think, he's getting people to, to dialogue, um, to actually not be um, believing in blind, blind faith. Now, the, in Tibet, there were some very large monasteries. All of them were rebuilt in India and Nepal. And most of them are close to the settlements, but there are also many, many smaller settlements. Now, the large Tibetan monasteries are teaching monasteries, but the smaller settlements are, um, I think the monks are there to, to serve the community. So this is an example. The, the lay person um, was a cook for this monastery and um, he's retiring. So they gave him a little special puja. And then what he's doing is he's um, given them clothing, uh, cloth for monk robe. So this, this um, back and forth between the monastic and lay people is you just, you just see them. This is um, traditional practices are kept up. This is a sacred monk dance. Uh, these are offerings, these are uh, teachings and the monks perform um, these dances uh, to tell stories during religious festivals and monks accompany the dance with music playing on traditional instruments such as the longhorn. Education is very important. This young novice is learning uh, ancient writing. These are also young monks. Uh, what they do, the system is quite interesting. They're memorizing and studying the scriptures. So in the morning, that's what they're doing. Then it looks like they're playing but actually they're debating among themselves. And in the debate, they're honing in what they've memorized and studied. Some of the larger monasteries are um, teaching monasteries. So these are monks who are studying the uh, 17 year program. And what the Dalai Lama has done is he added science to the curriculum. They also study and they then debate. So there's a lot of yelling and stomping and pushing and every mo movement means something. Monks are also involved with prayers. And finally, a photograph of behind the scenes. So um, they're serving up butter tea for their breakfast. Okay. This is Dalai Lama inside the temple. And he's smiling because he's very, very happy. Now, one of the major influences the Dalai has Dalai Lama has made is for the uh, for the nuns. They escaped much later in the 18 late sorry 1980s, and the nuns were not educated. When they escaped, there was nowhere for them to stay. They cannot stay in monasteries. So the Dalai Lama. Um, help them fund uh, nunneries. And a lot of the nunner nunneries were built by themselves. And then he said that they should study the 19 year old traditional monastic curriculum. So senior monks actually said, no, why should they study? Because in Tibet, um, they never study. And the Dalai Lama just looked at them and said, Buddha never discriminated against women. And so, they actually had to start um, helping the nuns. So this one is a long life prayer that the nuns gave to the Dalai Lama and he's so proud of them, that's why he's smiling. Now, at the beginning of my trip, I only saw monks teaching nuns. 10 years later, I started seeing nuns teaching nuns. This is a young novice nun I attended several ordination ceremony and it was really nice to see um, novice uh, nuns as well. This is Dalai Lama's private uh, temple. It's, it's not very big. Um, on that day, 60 novices were sitting in silence. And then when he came in, oh, this whole spot became very sacred. Um, it just really felt like he had breathed light into his paintings and the artwork. 
very few Tibetans have a lot of children. So many of these novices were novices from the Himalaya region. In the old days, the Tibetans um, um, from, I'm uh, sorry, the Buddhists from Mongolia or uh, Mustang or Bhutan would go to Tibet to study. And now they're coming to India to study. I realize what time it is, so let me speed up. So towards the end, um, a group of people would come in and he would explain this. And this is, uh, he always wants to talk to people. So they're rather shy, but he wanted to. Since childhood, the Dalai Lama has always been interested in science. At heart, he's a scientist. And when he first went to America, he um, started a dialogue with scientists and over time has created a mind and life um, dialogue between scientists and um, people, uh, monastics. Um, so this is the third, 33rd one I attended. When I met the Dalai Lama, I wanted to find out how somebody who grew up in such secluded and educated as a monk developed um, worldwide, a wider world viewpoint. He had traveled to Asia, but hadn't been to the West until 1973 when he was 38 years old. He was unknown and he could walk around freely. He spent quite a lot of time in London and he saw so much wealth and he thought that with wealth, people would be happy. But he realized that um, material wealth, scientific advancement didn't translate to high levels of serenity and satisfaction. And so what he saw was the paradox of external comfort and internal psychological and emotional suffering. This trip actually planted the seed of thinking of himself as a citizen of the world rather than a simple monk living in a remote village in India. He felt that Tibetan culture could offer something valuable to the world. And in the time I was there, so many international people wanted to have an audience that he invited hundreds of them to come to the courtyard. And he pulled out a chair and he sat there and um, people could ask him questions. So somebody said, asked him if he ever gets lonely. And he said, if I think of myself as a Tibetan, there are just a few of us, or a monk, there are even fewer. And if I think of myself as the Dalai Lama, there's only one of me in the world, I might get lonely, but I think of myself as one of 7 billion people and everybody's my sister or brother, so I never get lonely. And one, one of the refugees have, um, uh, sorry, other refugees have told the, uh, the Tibetans that they are very lucky they have the Dalai Lama. And the Tibetans say, yes, we now share the Dalai Lama with the world and how fortunate we are. This is a photograph of the Dalai Lama in his home. Uh, one day he saw me and he said, I want to invite you uh, in the morning when I meditate. He meditates from something like three o'clock to seven. I think I was there around six. And um, nothing in this house says Dalai Lama. This is, this is it, two LED lights, some radio, vitamins, there's a fax machine, there's a little Buddha statue. And uh, he's meditating, he's contemplating. And what, um, what was interesting is he works at being compassionate. So he said, if he cultivates a positive state of mind and the desire to be of service to others during the daily morning meditation, he said, there's the possibility to be compassionate all day long. So during the weeks I spent with him, he had played many roles, but he never changed. He is who he is, authentic, transparent, sincere, and compassionate. He has taken something really awful confronted it, and he has focused on what he could control and made them better for the Tibetan diaspora. He's grateful and kind, and this is powerful, 
and reverberates around the world. As I reflect on my meetings with the Dalai Lama, I understand why he's loved and respected globally. He's a radiant power of goodness who believes that we too can achieve goodness in his presence. We too believe in ourselves and that we can make a difference in creating a kinder and more compassionate world. He has opened the gateway to include all humanity. He leads a compassionate life for a holistic world. He is compassion in action. My journey is a reflection of the power of who he is. Many times I felt his guiding hand as he flipped on the light switch so I can photograph him or told me to come closer to where he sat so I can photograph the people's faces. As I listened to the taped interview, I saw a faint outline for this book. I didn't intend to write this book, but here I am inspired into action. Um, thank you very much for that. That was inspiring. Um, do you still have copies of your book left? Yes, I do. Um, I was very happy to find the publisher has completely sold out, but I had bought a lot. <laughs> I know. Amazing. I, I had bought a whole bunch and um, I'm selling them at 35, which is the, um, the, the retail price, but I'm giving all the profit to the Tibetan diaspora. So uh, if people want to buy books, uh, please let me know. And CPA has a few books too. Do you, are, the, are you selling them off your website? Is there a link I should share with people or just email, email you? I think email, yes. Okay. Please email me. Yes. I'll share your email. Yes, please. Thank, Thank you. you Anne. Thank you so much, Anne, for hosting. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody.